Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's your boy Tony right here with stories written by a current prisoner. You guys already know what it is. Go ahead and hit that like and hit that subscribe for the homie right here, Muhammad. Muhammad be going hard. Me and the homie right here, we're kicking it. We attended the fight. It was a good fight. But, you know, go ahead and hit that subscribe for him. He has a hell of a story. You see that he's been interviewing inmates. You know, the homie be getting down. And he has some very special guests coming up. So go ahead and hit that subscribe for your boy right here. Man, much love to Muhammad all day, bro. You have a prepaid call from an inmate at Correctional Facility, California. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. To accept this call, say or dial 5 now. Thank you for using. Hey, how you doing, brother? Hey, how you doing? Is this Oh, yeah, this is him. How are you, brother? Okay. Hey, I'm doing well. So what do you go by? Uh, my name is Joe. So I started drawing uh, a few years ago. Uh, mostly my best work is co uh, portraits in pencil, uh, graphite. Um, the example that I sent you in the mail is, uh, is an older one. It's from 2012. So it's a good portrait that I've got considerably better since then. Um, I also do painting in pastel. Uh, there's, a, the, there's a painting that I put in there of a cross that I did uh, a couple years ago. And there's also a pastel work of a, uh, of a portrait of a picture of Jesus, too. And there's also a pin portrait of an old uh, of an old guy from, like, the 1500s that I got a picture of. Um, I, was, I do animals in colored pencil. Uh, there's a picture in there of a, a set of uh, two giraffes that I did that were uh, really kind of kind of nice to uh, put on a wall, like, in a woman's house, which is where it's, uh, where it's hanging. I can do basically anything I can see. Um, as long as I can see the details clearly, I can, I can do the drawing or, or paint it either, either way. Um, my best work is with graphite pencil, which is regular pencil. Um, and uh, I use a, a grid on top of a picture that somebody would send me. So like when I do portraits, I know I need to be able to see the details and the faces really clearly. The best kind of uh, size pictures is like an 8 by 10 photo. Uh, and, and the faces, you know, about maybe 3 inches tall by about an inch and a half wide, that, that size picture, I can do really well. Um, so uh, basically, I've just been blessed with the ability to be able to draw fairly well, and uh, I've just been trying to use my talents for, uh, for good. Okay, if they want any customized drawings, um, so, you know, um, you viewers, you know, contact me, and I'll contact this gentleman for customized drawings. And What's your nationality? I'm um, uh, white, uh, is who I run with um, uh, culturally, but I'm also uh, por Portuguese uh, and a bunch of other stuff I'm not sure. Would you ever part of any gangs, groups, organization, or an associate? Um, I never formally joined a gang, uh, but once I started going to prison and jail, I, I, I automatically started associating with whites, and uh, I ended up believing and biting into all the white uh, white power stuff and, and the white uh, white supremacy. And I went with a lot of that stuff um, as far as getting tattoos and being involved with gang type activity on the main line. So uh, I've been involved, but I never formally joined in. And uh, what, what made you uh, be involved in the, uh, so to speak, in that organization? Um, there was really no other way out. When I came in, uh, I always grew up around other white guys, so I just kind of went with where I was, where they were, they, basically where the cops told me, are you white? And, and I said yes, and so they put me down as white, and I shelled up with a white guy when I first started coming into to prison. And uh, I was told, this is what you do, and this is what you don't do, and, and it just kind of compounded from there. So where are you from out here in the streets? Uh, Manteca, California. Excuse me, brother? Say again? Uh, Manteca, California. Oh, okay. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Um, what are you convicted of? Uh, first degree murder. And how long is your sentence? Uh, my sentence is uh, 25 years to life. Um, how long have you been incarcerated? Um, right now I've been incarcerated on this, this charge since uh, August of 2005. When you first got sentenced, how you feel about it? And when you first went to prison and hit the main line, what was your mentality? Um, so the sentence I'm in for now, I 
now was not my first time in prison. I've had five other small terms. Um, so the, uh, the first time I actually went to prison was in 1993, 1994. And I went to San Quentin. And uh, I was scared to death because I saw, you know, you come in on these big walls on either side, this main line yard where guys are working out. And, and uh, I was just a 23 year old, 24 year old kid. And I hadn't been to prison, no family been to prison. And uh, I, I was pretty scared. Um, even though I was going to be going home soon, I thought that uh, my first thought when I saw the prison yard was that, oh, oh heck, I may not make it out of here. And uh, um, so it was kind of a, a, a afraid, a fearful, and distressing situation the first time I came to prison. Okay, what exactly is your position um, within the wood pile? Um, I was just a rank and file kind of guy. Um, I, 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 I wasn't a, uh, I wasn't at the bottom of the heap, but neither was I at the top. Um, as, as the years progressed, I, I never was given any certain assignments, like you have this yard or that yard, but um, I became known as a person who was, that my word was good, and I would do what was necessary, um, to the extent that I would keep, if there was nobody that was in a, in a gang or nobody that I felt was had more uh, stature than me, I would take care of things within my sphere of influence so that when somebody showed up, I wouldn't be uh, called to account for letting certain things happen that were out of the, out of the ordinary. Um, but I never really was in any particular position within the, within the wood pile. Okay, can you uh, elaborate on uh, what types of tattoos you have and, uh, and uh, did you earn them in any way, shape, or fashion? And how did you earn them? If you can elaborate on those things? Um, I have mostly just kind of like wood polished tattoos on my arms, uh, some, some woods with uh, actually wood, wood with eyes on them, and uh, so, uh, yeah. some on my right arm, some uh, uh, Viking tattoos and Viking women and Viking ships. And on my back, I have a big tattoo of a guy holding some bars with chained arms, and he's biting through the bars. And on top of that, it says Weissmacht, which is uh, German white power the big iron cross in the middle of it. And uh, the white power on my back, I, I did I ask for a lot of my homeboys from San Joaquin County for permission. I said, hey, this is a tattoo that's a particularly kind of a, a, a sensitive tattoo as far as uh, what you're, what you're going to put on you. And I had just done a riot and some other cleanup jobs on the yard. And uh, they kind of tacitly approved it because I had done some things in service to the wood pile. Um, so, I earned it in that way, but it wasn't, uh, I never did a stamping to earn any of the tattoos that I have. I don't have any bolts or uh, I'm a warbirds on me. Okay, can you um, explain what type of uh, work you have to put in in order uh, to climb up the anarchy? This call stuff? and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. What type of work have you put in um, to climb up the ladder, so to speak? Or, um, um. You know what, there was never, um, I spent a lot of time in the hole and a little bit of time in the shoe, but it, it, it had things in, in various places in California, especially three or four years in Tracy. And uh, there were guys that would be uh, called on to, to staff somebody who came on the yard for, uh, they were a snitch or they did they did something wrong on the, on the line. And uh, I, I was always kind of crafty in that I would always volunteer for something that I chose to do, so I was never the guy that had his hand up. Um, and it was kind of calculating because I didn't want to be called on at a certain point to go have to stab somebody. I never fully bought in the white power stuff. So I was uh, I was there, and I, I made sure that my reputation as far as a person who would do something. Um, I did uh, assault a staff member one time for for, uh, for purposes that were in line with our beliefs. Um, and, and just always been the guy that was known to be willing to get him up whenever. But there was never, I was never in a place where I was called on to have to go do a certain particular mission for a certain thing. Um, I kind of avoided that. What is the rules and regulations of the whites? Oh, um, you don't, uh, you're not supposed to eat or drink with blacks. Um, you're not supposed to uh, um, involve yourself in business dealings with them that would involve uh, um, certain kinds of money transactions unless it was approved by the, the, the shot callers on the yard. Um, no, on the main line, no homosexual activity. Um, no, uh, you couldn't like, you couldn't go talk to the cops um, by yourself. 
Uh, people would check your, your, your slips when you put them in the box, like say you're putting in a medical slip. You would check them to see what was going on. Um, it was uh, kind of like, in certain skinhead circles, things were a little bit more strict, but for the general woodpile, that, that was the rules right there. You also, if there was any sign of a race rat, you had to be involved no matter what. If there was a mandatory yard call, you, you had to be out there or, or else. Okay, and was this... These things would, would would they qualify um, as a removal? And um, can you explain what would qualify as a removal? Oh, absolutely. Um, so a, a removal uh, would be like if somebody were to eat or drink with a black guy or get himself in drug debt, um, he would have to be removed from the yard. So uh, that would mean that you'd uh, usually send somebody on him, one guy with a knife, and then a couple guys would follow afterwards. To, uh, to put hands on him, to distract from the guy so he can get rid of the knife after he stabbed him. Um, and there could be other removals for, for other things too. There could be a political struggle between two guys that wanted to have keys on the yard or, the, or, or a reputation. Um, people could get themselves put in. And a lot of times it came down to who had the most friends. And uh, if you had better friends than somebody else, you got removed. And if you didn't, then, then the other guy would get removed. Um, but basically, for us, it was drug deaths, uh, interacting with other races, and uh, not uh, if the cops hurt one of us, then the cops would have to uh, we'd have to hurt one of the cops. So just following up on general retaliation uh, would be a cause for removal. Not following up. And who would be uh, chosen to uh, conduct the removal? Um, usually, people who hadn't done anything in the past, uh, new guys with long terms, uh, somebody who'd been in trouble. So if I get a smaller faction that didn't require removal, sometimes guys would say, You have 60 seconds remaining. You're up for the next thing smoking. And uh, that would be, uh, you'd have to be like a punishment at this point. What happens if an individual survives a removal? Where would they go from there? Well, um, that choice is pretty much up to them. Uh, they, they get put in an ATSEG or they go to the hospital or whatever happens, and they come back, and then they're usually in an ATSEG. Um, somebody will ask them, you, know, you, you got problems or why they stab you? And uh, there's some guys that say, you know, no, there's no problem, and they go back to the main line. They try to uh, clean it up uh, or um, they try to get back at somebody for doing something. Um, it's very few people that happens. Uh, to. Usually people will... Um, go ahead and go to a sensitive needs yard or sign up to say they want protective custody and they'll leave the main line and go to a different type of institution where there's no uh, politics per se as far as uh, but the, the, the politics are not like they are on the main line you don't have to participate uh, you can go somewhere where you can pretty much do your own time if you choose to okay and um were you ever in uh, did you ever do a shoe term? Um, I did a few small shoot terms, yes, um, in a, quite a while ago now, back in the early 2000s. And where did you do the shoot term at? Um, I did my longest shoot term at Tracy for the, about uh, eight months of it, nine months of it, and then I was shipped to uh, Pelican Bay Shoe for the last six months before my release date. I got an 18 month shoot for assaulting staff. Okay. And, um, what would you have to say to the youngsters that's thinking about, uh, you know, living the life that we have lived as a youth? Um, I would say that the, the, the dream people sell you about status and camaraderie and uh, homeboys and, uh, and, and all that, um, it's a lie. Um, the, the, the promises that you might think people are making that they're going to be your homeboy or one of the things the white guys used to say is, I love your life, brother. And uh, at the end result, nobody really cares about nobody but themselves. There might be on the surface some some caring and some camaraderie, but at the end of the day, um, especially when you get involved in the higher level gang activity, uh, it, uh, it's all about money and drugs and, and influence. And uh, um, if you don't fit into somebody's fast track to where they can get more... This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. If you don't fit in there, somebody's fast track on how you can help them achieve their goals, then you're going to find yourself uh, getting removed at some point, or, um, and you might not survive it. Um, the, uh, the thing that you're looking for that's going to give you the sense of approval and the sense of camaraderie is going to be found.
strong in Jesus Christ, um, who loved you and died for you. That's what I would tell these young kids, is that uh, the love and the, that they're looking for in gangs and they're looking for in these, these prison groups, um, you're only going to find it in Christ and in His church. And uh, that's what got me out of all the things I was in before. I've been clean now for eight years. I don't have any more need to use drugs and alcohol. And, uh, uh, and, and man, re please rethink what you're doing, because it ends badly. That's what I would tell them. How long were you involved in gang lifestyle, so to speak, and uh, put in work for the gang or the organization until you realized um, it wasn't for you? And, and what events occurred that make you realize that? Sure. Um, I was on the mainline activities from like 93 until 2006 or 2007 or 8. Um, and uh, what made me realize is that, uh, you know, the first time, the first cracks in my foundation were when I went to the Pelican Bay Shoe. And I realized that uh, even though I'd been sort of tough and I, you know, people didn't really bother me that much because uh, I, I made it known, it was known that, you know, I was, you know, a regular guy that would push back. When I got up there, I realized that I was out of my class. Um, I wasn't as tough as I thought I was because I realized that the end of my life was going to be locked down in one of them cells um, if I kept acting up. And I was either going to kill my celly on an order from somebody else, or I was going to get in trouble and my celly would kill me. And that was going to be the end of my life in some little concrete box uh, where nobody would be buried behind some steel where nobody would ever see me again. And uh, I realized right then that, that my life was in the wrong place. And after that, there were more and more things that kept happening in my life, um, including being arrested for a 12-year-old 12 12 murder. And uh, God had been chasing me and, and pour, pouring his love out to me through other people, and I kept rejecting it. Um, but um, there was a point at which I just completely broke down, and I gave my life to Christ. And, uh, and I knew that in, in 2004, when I, when I made that shift in my heart, when a belief in Jesus, that I was never going to be coming back to prison if I got out. Um, and then uh, shortly after that, I was arrested for murder. And uh, I ended up pleading as four years in the county jail waiting for uh, some kind of a deal. And uh, there was no deal coming. And I wasn't going to put the family through a trial. And I pled guilty. And I received a sentence of 25 life. And uh, I've never looked back. Um, I'd rather be in prison with Jesus than out of prison without him. Um, I sleep good at night. I'm at peace. And I do, uh, my whole life is geared toward uh, reaching out to people on behalf of my Savior to share the message of forgiveness to the gospel. Um, and uh, if it hadn't been for him, I'd probably be dead right now in a box. And uh, that's a horrible way to die. And I know many men have been, who had that happen to them. Okay, I, I don't have no further questions for you, brother. But do you have any uh, final words before uh, we close this uh, interview? Um, no, I, I, you know what, I just, uh, I, I want to reiterate again, I, I know I said it already, but my greatest hope in life is to, uh, to please God. My greatest desire now is to please God, where it used to be to please other people and hide from past pain. And I, I use drugs and alcohol and, and violence to do that. And, uh, you know, my life has changed, and uh, it's only because of Jesus and, 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 the, and His death on the cross for my sin. And, uh, you know, at some point, uh, I would encourage people to read the Bible, and especially in uh, the Gospel of John. That would uh, explain that to them in more detail than we can here at this short time.